Hi everybody, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we'd like to call the May 6th, or May 9th, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board to order. We have the roll call, please. Aaron Angel? Here. Scott Connors? Here. Jeff Allenborn? Here. Bill Fanwart? Paige Lewis? Here. Nicholas Navarro? Here. Here. And Tim Watt. Here. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll start with approval of the agenda. Does anyone have any proposed changes to the agenda? Yeah. Can we move the park hours right after the zero waste draft resolution? to make that change to the agenda? I move that we move the park hours discussion to directly after the zero waste presentation. Agenda as amended. Second, please. All those in favor? All right, the agenda is approved. Uh, now we need to approve the previous month's minutes. Does anyone have any changes to the minutes? If not, let's we'll take a motion to approve the minutes. I'm Sharon O'Leary, 534 Emory Street. Um, I served many years on the Parks and Rec Board and was a chairperson also, so I know um, the seats you're sitting in and the workflow. Um, it came to my attention through a neighborhood email that park hours were going to change and that this decision was basically made by four very hardworking city employees probably don't have enough time to go out after their long work day to enjoy the parks. I don't think this came from a bad place, but I think it came from the wrong place. So the fact that as a board, you don't already know everything about changing the park hours and why, the night before it goes for its final meeting tomorrow night at City Council meeting scares me. But what angers me and scares me is the lack of public process. That is beyond my comprehension. So my neighborhood park is Collier Park. And for many years, we had lots of problems. Same kind of problems that are still going on today, like homelessness, but we even had more than that. And I think homelessness now is a bigger problem, but I don't think the way to solve it is by sitting in the silo and coming up with a decision. You have an advisory board here. The city should have turned to you first. You should have given suggestions. It should have gone out to the public. You should look to other cities. This is not a novel problem for Longmont. This is a problem that's going on across the United States, and I think there's solutions out there. So let's just look at this from a park's point of view. If you want to get rid of undesirable use, put in desirable use. At Landon Park years ago, there was a problem, and the little league was going to pull out their um, T ball league because of the problems. And I wrote a letter to the editor saying, No, no, you need more. You need soccer. You need, you need to keep that park busy. And that's what scored for Collier Park. So in our master plan, we wrote to have this um, 
children's structure and it looks like a train. People come into our neighborhood with their children. It totally works. There's no quick fix right now except reaching out to the public. So what we're going to do is that people who live in apartments and they're hot can't go in their parks because we're going to change the hours after sunset. Then let's really think about we're displacing that problem and we're putting it on the police. And we're saying, okay, guys, now we've got these new rules. I want you to go out and enforce it. Because they think that's going to solve the problem. It's not going to solve the problem. It's one small piece in a much bigger pie. Then you've got to change all your signs with your new park hours. Well, now you've created another problem. Enforcement as well as um, new signage. Oh, what else do I want to say? Oh, the pop-up tents. Holy moly, pop-up tents. If you have kids, soccer tournaments, didn't you bring a pop-up tent? Well, what do you know? Who's going to delineate between a pop-up tent out there for over two hours to shade, because I don't know if you've noticed, but it's getting hotter, versus the homeless one? And again, that goes back to enforcement. Um, got that. Okay, so this is what I'm saying. I think you should be angered. I think you should demand that that should be put on hold. And may I suggest that as a board, you can always go, you can come to some sort of consensus. One or multiple people can go to the meeting tomorrow night and say you're representing and get your suggestions. Or you can write a letter and send it off tonight as a board. Very powerful. And that's how we got the right center. that were given at that time were integrated and reflected into the draft resolution. We also want to highlight this is very much a draft. We wanted to try to get all our ideas down on paper and then it'll most likely be consolidated. Um, we also are working with a consultant for our data analysis. So some of the updated targets that we presented to the board at our previous uh, uh, board presentation uh, have not been yet reflected because we're waiting for that data analysis to put to, um, in the best proposed updated targets to be presented to City Council. So we do not have those yet in, integrated. So I also want to highlight, uh, if anyone really wants to do a deep dive in, into this resolution, uh, I know we, I don't think we have time to do that tonight, but we're happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation after the there, And I'm happy to scroll through. Um, I Steve brought this up, so our, uh, just curious if there's any comments or concerns or questions. Okay. Um, I saw that there was an option to for curbside recycling to be weekly. Could there also be an option that it would be seasonally? Because many of us don't use our compost much in the winter, but I need a big container from now until November, right? So could there be seasonal tip, like, you know, pay for tip kind of thing? I don't know, just an idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I might uh, pass that to our waste services manager on, on uh, for Charlie to answer the kind of feasibility of some of those items. That camera up there, how should I do this? Come on. Like, I was thinking, like, the people that plow the sidewalks could just be the same people that do the composting, and so then they get more job when it's, yeah, that was my idea. But it has nothing to do with it. Aaron, it's good to see you again. It's good to see you too. Uh, unfortunately, our programs don't work that way. Different departments do snow, and different people do. Okay. But your question about could 
composting via seasonal fees. You know, we could add that to our notes and be part of what we present to our council when we're ready to do our formal presentation. But there's a lot of things that we all can compost in the winter as well, especially our food scraps, which are really the ones that provide a lot of methane into our atmosphere and the CO2. So that's my input on that. I mean, I do leaves all season long. I don't know about you all, but my leaves don't fall on that one week when we're supposed to pick up leaves. So happy to have the discussion and bring that forward to council. But that would be my response is that a year round program is probably a little better for a lot more people. But we do a big program for everyone, and it's just one of those options that we can put out there. For the targets and the action items, what is your time frame? Like, are you looking at this as a 10 year time frame? Or? So for the targets right now uh, that we're looking at a 2025 as well as a 2050, um, but we've also had gotten feedback from staff and others about the need. Our last year waste resolutions have definitely been most like there might be another one between now and 2050. Um, so it, it would be looking at both of the targets we're looking at are looking at 50% citywide Diversion by 2025. Right now, our target's just 50% uh, uh, residential. Uh, and then looking at different, the 2050 is kind of where they diverge, uh, one being 85% and one being 95%, and then one actually has a 2035 target. That's a little, so the more ambitious one has some different splits. Uh, but that's what we're working with our consultant to analyze because there's a lot of different factors. Uh, infrastructure being a big one that could help us reach that, and then also trying to understand the impact that could have on different sectors of our community uh, to, to make sure we're presenting uh, something that's ambitious but feasible for a lot more people. Um, I just have a question on the beach side of it, especially on residential. Um, as I understand it, you can't encourage by uh, fiscally encouraging uh, homeowners to. Recycle, right? We, we can only charge what it costs us to do the trash or do the recycle. Is that true? Because it says that there's a line of, of to revise the fee structure. As I understand, we, our problem when we started doing composting is that we couldn't make trash prohibitively expensive, so we encourage people to do composting. And that probably still stands. Is that true? Well, I think that's two things. If I can, I, yeah. if the, I think that's two things. So one is we don't want our services to be prohibitive for our residents. I think our council has been very clear and very aware of trying to not raise prices exorbitantly, right? We take care of everybody in the city. But I don't think we're beholden to saying it costs $5 to pick up your trash, so charge you $5. That's a decision that our council and through our recommendation with our consultants can bring forward, but that's a decision made by our council. But you could, you could charge different rates even though they're Jobs yeah. to pick up either way, right. charge higher for trash to help that encourage We currently have that is kind of how our, our, our pricing system is set up a, a little bit with having uh, we did try to price it specifically so that if you downsize to a smaller trash bin and added compost, that's still less than having a larger trash bin. We try to encourage adding that compost, but it's uh, increasing your trash size. So we did it in a, in a different matter where we, we're trying to keep it not exorbitant, but at the same thing, like there is a cost difference. Okay. You know, there's a value added, so to speak, to get the point. Yeah. I hope that it's on here and I haven't missed it, but I guess in terms of recycling and, and compost and things like that, first of all, there are alternating weeks, at least in my house, mm -hmm. but not everyone does composting, but everyone does recycling, right? So I guess that's one question is what happens in that alternating week when the people that would have done, I assume they're trading off or I But I guess I'm just wondering how- Can I ask an operational question? Well, kind of, but I guess what I'm, I'm really trying to say is do I, and I don't know this on my own bill, if I have a larger recycling set, I want to recycle a lot, do I have to pay more to recycle more? It's not at this time. So if I, because I haven't had this happen regularly, my recycling is overflowing. Right. So what do I do with that recycling? Let me elaborate a little bit. So great point. You want to open up right away. Yeah. So 
great point, and it's something that we're going to talk about as we continue moving forward, and probably closer more so when we talk about a rate change for the sanitation funds. We haven't changed rates since 2017, and that's coming. Right now, we offer one recycle bin, a 96 gallon recycle bin to every resident, a 96 gallon pickup every other week. So we have a choice in the city to do our due diligence to say, do we want to pick up weekly? You heard somebody say that earlier. Uh, Denver's going to that model. Uh, the other choice might be, because that's cost, that's very expensive, but another choice would be, should we, should we allow residents to have more than one recycle bin, right? Because I don't need two recycle bins, but maybe you do. And that's okay with me. But how do we make sure we're not overspending on our fund and do the analysis to say, okay, well, maybe you should have a recycle bin. If you want a second one, it's whatever we come up with through analysis. So there's a couple of options out there because not everybody recycles at that level. And some people, you know, just don't buy a lot, so one isn't. That, that yeah. 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 Thank you. That's there, there's one thing you mentioned that we, I, I, I only go directly to your question, but we also are looking to, you mentioned composting is often recycling is not often everyone had a recycling bin. We are looking into what if we switch composting to be more like recycling. Is that feasible? Uh, what would the cost of that be? So that is also something we're looking into. I think, you know. And I, I did not mention too, we also have a recycling center that's open 24 7 for home single stream drop off recycling seven days a week so if you happen to have extra recycling you put it in the bag take it over drop the bag in the single stream so. so a similar question here but maybe focus on the parks uh, part of this so in the draft resolution approach to gym goals there's a municipal operation section talking about recycling bins and composting bin, uh, bins at park facilities i noticed that for recycling bins it says in all park facilities but for composting bins, it's only in key park facilities. And I'm curious what the, why the difference in the language there for, for each of those. I can speak to that. Yeah, yeah so the, the reason for that is, uh, is contamination. And there's probably parts of our park system, and our park system is vast, it's massive. How many parks do we have? Like 42 parks and 5,000 miles of trails. I mean, they just get more and more. <laughs> but there's parks that really, more and more, but, but there, there's areas like where there's shelters, where there's a uh, sandstone ranch, where there's places where people really congregate and do things, you know, uh, park, park Centennial Park, mm -hmm. where it would be really very advantageous to have composting where there's food and that sort of behavior. Out on the St. Grain Greenway heading towards Sandstone Ranch at that last turn, probably don't need a compost bin out there. You're going to have you know, um, stuff out there that might sit longer or not even be used and it's a cost of infrastructure. So in the industry, it's generally thought of that. Being said, if we find that we do something like that and we realize, oh, this park needs compost, well, then it's competition. It's a matter of having the resources to service it. And, you know, but that's how that came about. Got it, okay. Uh, as a follow-up question there would be just, is that awesome that we would determine based off of analysis? Uh, with data, or is it just more of a best effort? We know that food is happening in these specific locations. I think, so. I think a little bit of both. I think through the knowledge of our staff that say this is what happens in these locations, and then the staff then go clean the park and say, yo, here we have more bottles and cans and stuff versus that. But you know, once we lay a blueprint down, it doesn't mean black and white, that's all we're going to do. We're going to learn and scenarios will be improved and changed. I would just add that, that kind of professional staff piece too. The staff does count number of bags, that's how we keep track of. We don't have a good way to count the number of people in our parks because of course entries into our parks are like trail that you just go through. So counting trash bags is a couple of things. It looks at how much increased mud we have, so look at amount of use, so that helps the staffing needs as well. Um, and they also do shelter reservations out of the parks too, so we know which ones are being used for for food and activities like that too. So that, that goes into it. There's probably not an equation to plug that into, but it really is working with Charles and his staff and Timber and his staff to try to figure out what these most appropriate spots are. That's great. So uh, good to see the two organizations, the departments collaborating on that. Um, you mentioned that we have 24-7 recycling, but I have noticed that uh, you can't take your tree limbs on Sundays. 
And that seems to me like the main time that you would want. Like, who cares about Monday? That's only my people can take their tree loans or the, the like landscaping service. But I need it on Sunday, yeah. like that kind of thing. And your plastic bags and things like that. I'd love to see at least a readjustment of the hours for. Yeah. And I'm also a little late for this because it's going, it either came up today or that. I'd love to see the city of Longmont back the house bill that requires um, the manufacturers and the providers of the trash that in packaging to be responsible for the disposal of that. Are because, you referring to the extended producer responsibility bill? Yes. Yes. Like I believe council supported that last year. Oh, good. Yay. Okay. Didn't see that. Yay. Good job. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> I got, I got I, one off my list, sorry. Okay, well, yeah, because that really, it's going to really, you know, that will really reduce our cost. It just shifts the cost back to the people that make us have too much cost. Awesome. Thanks. I just have a couple of process questions. So, one, um, there's a long list of actions, and so I just wonder who is responsible for sort of prioritizing which of those actions the city starts with and you know who will there be like an implementation plan for something that's developed and then the other question is um, when you get your data and incorporate the specific targets will we have a chance to see this again and have all the numbers supported? so part of that that data analysis will probably help us to determine but where we need to start and prioritize um, i I don't, it, so that would probably lead to help creating the next steps of where we go, and then we can probably also use that information to in, uh, integrate into our next sustainability plan update. And then, uh, yes, uh, are we a plan to go to city council on June 28th? I do not believe we're having another time that we're planning to come back to the board, but we'd be happy to send out a closer draft version if, uh, if it is like to see that feedback over here. over, but tonight I'm going to try to do a little bit of a do-over. If everyone remembers last month when I had kind of made a long meeting and ran late and everyone kind of said we're out of here at 9 o'clock, I think was the, the piece there. I kind of squeezed in the last three little amends made to our parks rules and regulations, and I, I mentioned that we're doing um, a changing our hours. Um, that change will be for neighborhood parks, and that will be from one hour before sunrise to one hour after sunset. We also now have a definition of camping. So we've always had, there's no camping in our parks except in a, a, a allowed place, which is always Union Reservoir. So that doesn't exist anymore. So there really is no place that is allowed to camp right now. So we never had a definition of what camping is. So like Sharon mentioned, um, it's going to be an important piece of trying to figure out, but having some sort of idea of what camping really is. So it really isn't people at the soccer meet watching their kids. Um, we're trying to tease that out. It's going to take probably some work doing that, but the definition we came up, trying to take into little pieces into consideration of what that really is, so that officer discretion can be used as well as, well as we look at that. Um, and then the other one was the shelter reservation. And that is really having no more than 15 people without needing a reservation. And that one actually is a benefit to us as well. We just talked about staff gets reservations for shelter, so if there's people out there, they're eating food, they're using it, we know to go clean up afterwards too. So reservation gives us some information on how we can better manage our shelters as well, and if you use it for longer than, than two hours as well. And that's one of the things that um, Ed sure talked about. Some of the behaviors we're seeing in the park with vandalism, homelessness, improper use of the facilities, how do we kind of address that? And I think Sharon's had a great job in her community, in her park, trying to reprogram things, and that's one of the things I think we've looked at. But, 
What I really ended up with last month here was the result of a fairly long process uh, that Parks and Natural Resource uh, was working with the group that came up with these. We worked very closely then with the legal group to try to craft the language to fit in and took into consideration, well, what about the pop-up tent? Well, what about the family that's just hanging out trying to uh, stay out of, out of the sun? So we, we looked at those and we came up with some language that's now going to council. But there is a lot of backstory on that. And that backstory came out of um, the community brought it to the city. The city then created the process that's a little bit different than probably what we were used to in the past. And I think for staff that was a little bit challenging too. Uh, but there's a center of excellence that developed a neighborhood impact team. That in neighborhood impact team really did work with the parts of Lanyon Park where we're seeing those problems. That problem then should build a car park and work with them. And then we looked at how we can be proactive and bring this system that created some positive results into the broader picture. That went to, into the council with Carmen serving a presentation. So what we're going to do now, right now is kind of rewind a little bit and let Carmen Ramirez um, for Community Neighbor Resources give a presentation and then Master Police Officer um, Sarah Hardy to talk about how we really ended up at this place. And then we can talk about the rules and rights a little more specifically. You've got questions about well, what about this part, what about this event, how that really play into it. Okay. Good evening. I'm Carmen Ramirez, I manage Community and Neighborhood Resources, uh, which oversees conflict resolution these neighborhood groups and then also we are doing social equity internally for the organization. Um, I will let you know that uh, I have the, the real privilege of living and working with the Indian community. I've been here 31 years um, and have worked with different issues at our, at our parks throughout the years. And uh, really there are three pieces here that are being proposed. And one is that definition of camping the other one is the shelter reservations, and the last one is the park alleys. Okay, so Langham Park uh, was the one that really kind of kicked this to the forefront because Langham Park was becoming the broken window in that neighborhood. We literally had neighbors that said, I refuse to go to that park. I had neighbors that gave me all sorts of examples of not why they could not take their children to the playground. There's two shelters that are close to the playground and then the restroom. That restroom has been vandalized multiple times. Uh, and so one of the things that we decided to do is we met not only with the neighbors, but we met with a group of unhoused folks. We also met with um, the agencies that are providing resources. And we also met to do some reach out, uh, outreach, sorry. Uh, so we were trying to do that, that in, in concert with everybody. What we did at that point is we tried a temporary change in um, park curfew hours. We added some lighting in the shelters for the evening. The daytime is where we had issues. And Sharon is absolutely right. The more activities we can get into a park, the more we can get the community to trust. And right now there is no trust. We have had two resource fairs. I'm working with a, a group of Latinas who work on um, health promotoras uh, to do activities in the park and try to get recreation as well as our youth center to get out there. The evening, we usually don't have scheduled activities in the evening. So it's an interesting question to, to ask, why do the parks need to be open? Um, I do a lot of work around disparities and equity, and I can tell you that I definitely am an advocate for most of our low-income Latino families that are living in multifamily, they need to have access to green space. So I don't know if that access has to happen at 9 or 10 o'clock at night. Um, I, we haven't had that question out there. What are the nighttime activities? I don't think we have anything scheduled with regulation or other Baseball. Activities. Baseball. Yeah. So that it's also very, it has to be very clear that the activities that are usually sanctioned that are registered or, or have reservations, we're not talking about those. We're not talking about the light of basketball courts. Those are carved out in exemptions. Uh, the shelters, we're talking about two hours uh, because literally at Lennon Park, we had this, uh, situations where shelters were occupied by at least a dozen people surrounded by shopping carts where they literally built a fort. They were literally jumping over the shopping carts to get into the center and putting up tarps. The definition of what camping is, 
is you're actually setting up to live. Very different than you're setting up a sunshade to watch a game, right? Very different. So I wanted to share that that's where it came from. And then also police was also receiving uh, a lot of the calls and having to look at what's the enforcement we can do. I will tell you that every time we have started, we changed the, um, uh, the hours at Car Park. We sent out notices. Uh, to about 300 homes, that's like three, three, three. to about 300, 350 homes. I got two calls, both said thank you, thank you, thank you. No one else called to say they disagree. We do those letters in Spanish and English. We did have parents that said, and even officers that expressed concern that uh, at Car Park, the shelter is right by the playground, that the smoke was so thick from marijuana that it would be impossible for anybody to take their child to go play at the playground. This is during the daytime. Again, I'll ask the question, I'm not sure. Beyond the, the sanctioned activities like baseball, basketball, pickleball, those are exempted out. So, Sarah, do you want to? Sure. Um, well, Sarah, already, for those of you who don't, few of you look familiar to me um, in the community, I've worked in Longmont since 2007 and been in law enforcement for about 23 years now. Um, I'm currently serving as a neighborhood resource officer, myself and Dave Kennedy, basically work on uh, we're kind of project managers, um, work on long-term issues. Uh, I, I run our crime-free multi-housing, actually crime-free housing, it's not multi so much anymore because we serve single family and duplexes and all that good stuff, but basically our crime-free housing program um, has led me in the direction, I'm the housing lady and I call Dave the, the unhoused man because he started our street outreach team. So, um, together we have been working in, in and around all the issues of housing and, and our unhoused folks for several years. Um, and that goes with all the parks. Um, I, you're in the room and, and uh, so Collier Park was a big problem for a long time. That, that neighborhood, you know, Carmen brought it up earlier, the, the neighborhoods really can make an impact and help, we can all help each other. Lane and Park is a different, uh, has a different dynamic, right? Every neighborhood park has a different dynamic and, and socioeconomical circumstances living around it. Um, I also live in this town. I have um, for a long time and I live by a park. I love the park by me and I use it often and it does have lights. Um, needless to say, it's a sidebar. I just wanted to let you know that I, I too live by a park and, and understand the need and um, the availability for people to use the park when it should be used. I can't say from a law enforcement perspective, this hour change, it might not be significant to you and this is what we've been doing forever. Let's try something different. I mean, the old adage of, uh, and, and I can say this because that's kind of the culture of law enforcement, well, why are you doing this, folks? Because we've just done it this way forever. Well, what what's working and what's not? And that's what we've really been able to determine with this change of the times. I can tell you tomorrow night, and if you guys want to hear some numbers, I brought them with me, but we changed the hours in December. And I can tell you, we've gotten not only community comments, but our, the officers I work with, we're seeing drastic increases in our extra patrols and people basically going into the park that should, it should not be there at a time where they're literally now you were talking about the shelters, now they're using the tree at Landing Park to just kind of camp around. So, so ultimately, have, have any of you driven north on 287 lately through Loveland? And if you're a parks person, there's a park right on your right hand side once you pass 402. Do you know what that looks like right now? It has probably about 50 tents in it. And I can tell you, even though I'm an officer, if I wanted to go walk through there, I wouldn't feel safe. So I, I ask you all this. I am, I am a police officer, but I also live in this town. And I can say from our issues with housing and the, the improvements we've made with the things that we've done, we've made drastic impacts on our, on our crime in this city. We have. And it's, it, it is rising and it has been rising in our parks. So uh, I would definitely ask, I've shared this, these, these numbers with y'all that like numbers. 
but we've seen we've seen a good impact and we've seen even today our landing park i checked our folder do, so we basically had to set up an email and a, and a phone number for residents to call us and we have one that loves to blow our email up and she she's giving us good information and she's giving us positive comments but guess what law enforcement can't always be there so guess what else we've done we're working very very hard with our parks department and they are working very hard to help us and we're basically moving forward and our, and our public safety attorney wants us we have the standards of behavior in our buildings we want to talk about this and i know this is very this is very new um, information but we want to talk about this what does that look like in our in our public spaces um why can't a parks person if they were comfortable you know tell someone hey you know you, your time's up it's time to leave and if that person doesn't want to go then, then you can call the police you know so we definitely work through these processes of, of getting more city staff involved because it can't just be the police doing anything um, and i don't want to go down that that rabbit hole with you know numbers and staff because i'm sure mr one would have heard it till he's blue in the face but um we're, we all have been working on this project for a long time and um, i think that's all i have unless you have questions for me specifically we do have the powerpoint that we're going to show you council uh, so if you want to go through that we'd be glad to go through that um and then also answer any questions that you may have so i'll let you all check. <laughs> I have a quick yes. question. I agree. I'd like to see it. My question is, or to you, David, this is great. And I remember we had this discussion over several months, two months maybe, about Union Reservoir hours. But this is the first time we've heard about this one. Did, uh, is there anything we can do at this point? If it's going to council tomorrow, why, are we wasting time? I'll show you up here because I just want to let you know that, again, Parks has been very supportive because as they talk about, the impact really is on the parks. It's on the parks users, it's on the park staff. Those, those shopping carts, they're making a camp around the shelter. That's park staff is having to put those in vehicles along with police officers. Driving I'm not arguing. I'm saying but for this board, so, what are we doing? So I guess what I want to say is that, seriously, this is a little bit different way of doing things process-wise. I mean, we'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, but it's because it's new doesn't mean it can't be improved. So I do think there are some opportunities for us probably to talk to this group more. Um, but this group, I think, probably is what's, what's coming out from this Centers of Excellence and the Neighborhood Impact Team really is to help inform the community on some of these changes that these groups that are really close to these problems are trying to resolve and trying to implement. I think what the, the board could do is the board could help us provide some insight from you all. There are three items on there. You could support all three. You could support one or two. You could support none. And you have a liaison who is part of council and will be seeing this tomorrow night. So you have an opportunity to communicate that to the liaison as well as the full council. Nothing has been passed. The ordinance hasn't been passed. And do we need a second reading or? It's, it's, it's on this it's general yeah. business. General basis of so discussion. First reading. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's it's discussion and first reading and second reading. So we are at a good time to have this conversation. I apologize if we shouldn't have come earlier, but we did go to council February eighth, and we gave them an overview of the the issues we were dealing with and the efforts that we were making. And I think you all know uh, that a lot of the societal issues that we're dealing with, there is not one solution. This is not going to resolve all of that, but what we are trying to do is provide a guidelines and ability to enforce when the bad behavior is causing displacement of park users. When the, the Little League says, I do not want to take my team there, we no longer want to make a reservation because there's drug deals and people shooting up in front of us, that situation is a response when, when the Little League says we're not going to go there anymore. So you could definitely look and tell us we support all three, we support one, we support none. Thank you. That answers my question. Thank okay. Between and, and then you can tell comments. Yes, no, and this comment that this is general business. Yep. It's not too late. It's not. Got it's it. not too late. And just, you know, Sarah had mentioned that on the first landing park and car park, there's a there is a way in the rules and regs that the director can make that change. So the first two we did that, but as we went as this a broader um, 
reach across our parts. We definitely want to make sure this is going in front of council, that people have a chance to have input on this. So this really does give that opportunity. So, oh, yes. Um, could, could people go with the numbers? Is there a drastic increase in the numbers? So, well, would that be part of your presentation? It's not in the presentation. Okay. I'll, I'll go quick. Um, well, so since we changed the curfew, that's, that's the, so during the day, we can't do anything unless we visually see it, right? We got a complaint by our, our friend, hey, I saw alcohol bottles out on the table. Law enforcement can do something about that, but we walk up, they hide things. Needless to say, during the day, we're kind of out of luck. At nighttime, we've seen a definite impact on us being able to. And by the way, we started with we started with this this conversation started with our nonprofit partners. Hope we did not just go out and as law enforcement and so to speak take care of business. This we had everyone talking about it. We gave verbal warnings. We've given a ton of written warnings, and now we've moved to tickets for curfew. Now, granted, the folks that we're giving tickets to, and this, this is just more food for thought for you, if you care, um, we know that these folks are unhoused. What's the point of giving them a ticket? But we have a process that we've worked out with our judge that we're doing different things than just basically slapping them in the fine because that doesn't make sense, right? So uh, those conversations are being had even at the county level for, for our DA's office. Um, so we implemented it in December for our, our extra patrols. We were there 146 times in December for extra patrols. This is to land and park, park, land and park or, in particular. Got it. That's that's just December, and that's when we really hit it hard. Um, January we're there 82 times. February 33, March 34 or 32, excuse me, um, and then so far in April this was last run the 28th. So, um, and I'm the one that's in, I'm, I'm inputting all this data uh, myself. So I can tell you that in the last two weeks, we've been there a lot. And it's because it's getting warmer. So Is there a that helps you. There in general? All the time. All the time. But when, when we can uh, do something is at night. And there's no reason people need to be there at night unless they're a legitimate user. And in, David brought this up earlier. All of our officers are being educated on this and the fact that they people can walk through a park. I mean, we're using the land use code at its finest, right? Like if an, if an officer gets an officer gets called for someone walking their dog through a park, they're not going to dispatch that, right? That, that doesn't make sense. You know, if they're hanging out, taking a nap, it's mid midnight, you know, then that's something that we're in response to. I can go quickly yeah. through yeah, how that you want if you want to do that. So as I said, these are the three areas that we're proposing some changes. The camping definition, it exempts out the, the soccer moms or the families that are going to be there. Facility and shelter reservations, as I said again, that we're looking at two hours. And it's really a courtesy, just kind of keep things moving so that folks can go eat dinner. I will tell you that it's so bad that one time when our city manager drove by Landon and called me, he said, I just called to tell you there's a family having a picnic because we hadn't seen it in so long. So, and then the park hours is that curfew that we've been talking about. Uh, we have implemented that curfew at Landon and Car Park. And what we have gotten is good response there in favor of this. Um, go to the next slide. Whoops. That's not it. <laughs> uh, let me see. I'll tell you real quick if we don't have it. <laughs> wow. As far as people have ever seen it. I have never seen it. So, here's, here's, let me tell you this. Windings. Oh, there you go. No, it's, it's winding. Yeah, it is. Um, go ahead. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. I'm going to on What's the one you was in? No, <laughs> we want like on April first. Uh, we know. want yeah. one, but sometimes I think we change. I'm impressed that you came up with that so quickly. I won't tell your employer. <laughs> Couple months out. Did that work? No, it's not weird. It's all over. Forty-two point two dollars. You changed my mind. No, you did have something to do with the font. Okay, let me. Uh, 
I don't want to keep you. I know you have This might be more. something you want to fix before tomorrow evening. <laughs> yes, we're going to have to fix it. This is our dry run here. Dr. Waters will be on the lookout for that one. Oh, we're going to read this one. Yeah, right. There you go. Um, Not good. Why don't we do this? You got it? Yeah. Select all the, uh, you must be using a custom font that isn't itself. That's, that's, my, that's yeah. my guess. Yeah. yeah. Select all and do all that. It's so tiny that it replaced it with that. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Here's, so here's here's gonna, I'm just going to go through this real quickly. So the Niggerhead Impact Team is an interdepartmental team that addresses different issues. We've addressed issues like illegal dumping in alleys uh, in some of the low-income rentals. We've addressed other issues uh, beyond that. But when we looked at Lanyon, and that was based on multiple, multiple calls from the neighbors that said, you know, this is, this is impossible. We can't deal with this. We can't go to our park. I had an 84-year-old that uh, went to bed early but would set his alarm for 11 p.m. so he could get up, look outside his window, so that's how close he looks, and see who was camping out there, and then call police. And so I'm like, I, I, we got to do something, right? Um, a lot of the Latino families that I do know, I did talk to them, and they said, nope, nosotros no podemos ir al parque por los problemas que existen. So they couldn't go to the park because of the problems that existed there. So our, um, what we wanted to do was ensure that public spaces and identified neighborhoods are used as intended and are welcoming and safe for all residents and visitors. So if you think about it, even the unhoused individual that doesn't, isn't really causing a problem, that's not going to really be the person we're after. If you've got a dozen people who are drinking and cussing and throwing up, by the playground, that is not a welcoming place for the neighbors, right? So we have to address some of those behaviors. Ensure alcohol and drug use and littering is identified and addressed. Ensure park shelters are available for all users. Increase resident activity and rec recreational use of the park. That's part of our plan, but it has been very hard to gain the trust. There is not a registered neighborhood within that area. There are a lot of multifamily. Sarah actually has four, five crime free, multi ten crime free multi housing um, properties within that area. Um, so that's really what we're trying to do. We also have been working, as I said earlier, with community partners to ensure that we're connecting people to resources. Um, I told one guy that I know who's been uh, in house for a number of years, and I said, Hey, Jim, you're getting a little older. Isn't it time to get off the streets? How do we help you do that? And he says, I know, I know, but I can't do it, Carmen. And so we are making those connections, and we are trying to do this compassionate compliance. Um, the piece of sustaining a, ba a balance of comp compassionate intervention and also efforts that support and welcome, um, make our public spaces welcoming and safe, is this piece. We also have to have some guidelines and some rules so that we can help make the places welcoming to all, especially the neighbors that live in that area. Um, so we have been working with these partners, and basically that's it. Oh, look, he did it all. <laughs> so really, we are working with community partners to decrease the number of unhoused folks. Homelessness is an issue for every single community. I don't know of a community unless they're very, very tiny that is not dealing with this. We work in collaboration with the agency partners. <coughs> We're having issues there. We had an outreach team by L there. In one week, out of their team of four, that uh, outreach, they lost three people. So that's another piece of this, is the reality of that. Um, again, that balance of intervention, services, and compliance that supports welcoming and safe public spaces. Um, it's not unusual that I walk up to the park with some of the outreach, and they're like, Oh, you speak Spanish. Great. Come and talk to this gentleman who I know has had alcohol issues for about 40 years. And getting this individual into services, there's resistance, there's mistrust. We are dealing with the folks that really um, have the most challenging um, life situations and cannot easily go into a program and it's resolved. We all would love to, to say that would happen. 
a communication plan. We set up a voicemail and an email specifically for Lanyon and for CARP, so folks could go there directly instead of going here and then there and there. Right? So they have one space. Um, Sorry. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so we changed the curfew hours at Lanyon and CARP Park. Most of the neighbors have really expressed appreciation. There was one person that was concerned about going out to observe bats in the evening. And as David said, if you're walking your dog through the park or you're observing bats, you're one person. That is not the kind of behavior that we're going to address by enforcement. So the uh, amendment changes will help to address and sustain the efforts. As Sarah said, we've done put a lot of effort into that frontline staff that is going and talking to folks that are homeless, going and talking to neighbors, going and talk to the folks in the apartments. Um, and this is how we can help to sustain. It is not a solution, but it is a little bit of some tools that will allow us to address some of the behavior that was making those parks unwelcome. And I think, is that it? That's it. In wind, then, is it says thank you, I think. <laughs> in wind? Yeah, oh, okay, yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> it says thank you. Any questions that we could? Can I just add this? Yes. Landon Park is not the only, but Landon was yes. the focus of this. So Ward 1, through Ward 1, so um, 11 months ago, I started getting lots of phone calls from residents in Landon Park. And I, you know, and we've had this conversation. Um, the response, I have to say, uh, I was not as optimistic then as I am now that this response would have the effect. My worst fear is that the park would be shut down, right? The, the, the starting place here was more about health and safety for the, for the people in the parks and the residents around the parks. But that is the first priority with understanding it is a complex, layered, and nuanced set of legal issues that this teams have to, to, to navigate their way through. From the AL, ACLU to the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution to what's happened in Boulder and Aurora and other communities, it's, it is a fine line they've walked. And they've, I think they've walked it really well to keep the parks open, not to shut them down. They've listened well to lots of the public to give people their park back and to do that in a way that is as humane as it can be, right, to those folks who um, are unhoused, and not just unhoused in this case, folks who are unhoused and simply don't have much regard for our community standards and, and our laws. So um, I would like to think that any, any resident around any park, if they have the same situation, would say to this group, thank you, right? Thank you for, for how you stepped up and what you've done. And we'll get a chance to talk about it again. Yes. <laughs> Just one quick, do you have a copy of the exact language of the definition of the yes. proposals and stuff? The ordinance? I have a copy right here if you'd like to read it. Oh, I just wondered if there was one that could be shared with the other. We can share copies here at the CG still. Sure. That'd be great. And it also is on the council communication for tomorrow night also. Yeah. How does yeah. how does this affect the other part of parks like the open space park? Look, I know when I've been on the same train too big, there's many people camping mm -hmm. in the thicket. Is that a park? So yes. Uh, and that's where we work together very closely with the park rangers. Um, and and I unfortunately have been Dave, Dave's getting a lot of, I think it's fantastic actually how much information we're now sharing. Not that we weren't doing it before, but I think we've just made it, heightened it to our number one priority of sharing this information. So I, I will disclose this to you. Um, we are going to maybe see some increases to more on households. And my idea is we're going to be down in Greenways here shortly. The county is moving some folks out off 119 in the Sugar Hills that now are being called the White Mountains. Um, this is all pretty new stuff, but my my bet, and that's why I got David on board with the park rangers, that they're going to be probably moving down to the And we work, I can tell you, yeah, I the amount of hours that park rangers and myself and my partner Dave Kennedy Patrol doesn't have time to, they deal with the disturbances, but we go out and actively look for these camps, tag them when we can, and um, to move them along. But I, I know that it, it's not going to, it might get worse before it gets better, and it usually does in the beginning of the summer. So, 
I guess I was just supposed to ask, is the door in the effect of the season? So the camping definition would Yeah, so affect. camping so camping is that definition and camping is gonna get those definitions. Yeah. I'm asking what it applies to, not what's camping, but does it apply to parks like landing or does it apply to the so, like so the okay. yeah, so camping goes across our whole system. So camping is not allowed. Allowed us to say designated spot. Right now they're on the busy spots. So camping is really that greater than two hours under some sort of power and having, you know, that Living activity associated, so the eating and the cooking food and that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of pieces to go with that definition too. So that covers all of our parks. There's open space, greenways, all public, actually all public lands. Right. Um, the hours change only changes our neighborhood parks. So our community parks where we know we have scheduled soccer matches and baseball games and flag football, those are still scheduled to run through Jeff's program. So those aren't changed with the hours. Camping can still apply. So um, under the way we looked at this, if Jeff has that lease to a St. Mary's soccer program, they can have a kind of long tour so they rented that space. So again, that camping applies to the park unless you have a reservation that, that gives you permission to, to be there for the whole event. And then the shelter reservation is across all our shelters. I have a downloaded question. Is it illegal to be, I literally don't need this is not a reservation. Sure. Is it illegal to be homeless in Walmart? It is not illegal. So where can they go? I don't get it. I'm so, going to a place that they are having. Well, so here's the issue is we work with Hope, which provides a lot of services. They actually right now have three safe lots. So safe lots are if you're an individual who does not have a home and you're living in your car, in the evening you keep every one of these parking lots. Like the Walmart or what? Well, no, actually they have different places where you can access uh, services. Uh, facilities so you can go in and take a shower, have a meal, or, you know, those kinds of things. So the need, and that's just to tell you the need, so it is not illegal to be homeless and across this nation that's the way that it goes. It is not illegal. It is the behaviors, it is the living situation. I will tell you that nine times out of ten, uh, Hope Shelter, they have a shelter, usually has available beds. The segment of folks that are on house that are the most visible to the community are also the most resistant for a very complex, but they're the most resistant to engaging and being part of systems. Um, so I think that's a, another piece of that. Carmen, could you, you just, add, if you just add the L, you made reference to the elevator team. Yes. Talk a little bit, a bit more about who they are, what they've done, and, and vouchers that are used or not used to house people every night. Yeah. in transitional housing if they need So one of the things that we did early on is that we met with these community partners. And it's, it's a very interesting conversation when you talk to uh, folks that are providing a specific resource for a specific segment of our community, right? So they're looking at someone who's unhoused and doing whatever they need to stay connected and try to engage them. When I asked them about how do they communicate the impact that community has on the neighbors, it said, we, can, we, we don't really do that. We don't really talk about that. So we started that conversation. And also we started to, as Sarah said, our, the coordination of our communications with Elder, we could identify more quickly uh, individuals that, that Sarah knows, that I know, that Elder knows, what do we need to do to work on getting those individuals. So they're, they were doing, because we just lost some members, but they were doing outreach not only at the parks, but they were doing it in other areas where we have homeless folks. In the Greenways, um, but on Hobart, I don't know if you've noticed, on Hobart there was some waterways where people were setting up camps. So they were going and outreaching to them. I also had conversations with folks that go and feed people in the parks on Sunday. So I went out there on Sunday, I took them brochures of the resources that we had. They have very big cards and good intentions, and what they would say is, I had no idea. I've never talked to anybody from the city. So it's like, here's my number, call me, let's talk, let's work together. The more that we work together, the more our opportunity is just to engage. You have to realize that some of these folks, um, their stories are amazing stories of survival and resilience. But there is a level of resistance, and that resistance is I, I don't work within what is provided. Uh, so we try and, and really be diverse and also be understanding of their plight. And so that's why those outreach folks, 
and the, the folks that work uh, with hope around homelessness have been crucial to be in communication and coordinated efforts. And again, for the Rangers, so talk a little bit more because the Rangers have the greenways and stuff. That that's where the training they go through. They train with with hope. Um, when we were able to introduce ourselves to people living in that situation, the first thing is offering services. If they don't want services, that's their choice. We give them the options. But the first thing you do is try to make sure they know that opportunities that one off provides um, for that. The other thing, if we go and find those tents and camp them, don't go the back of the, the truck and start picking them up. We tag those. We click on that tag where they can go for resources and what amount of time they have to keep them with the contact as well. It, it's fair to say, it's not, I think this is true, that, that our standards for public lands are simply those that we're applying in our parks, mm -hmm. greenways. The same thing we did a couple of years ago to the downtown area. Right. Yes. We applied the, the, our, our standards for public lands to downtown, and it's had a very positive effect in terms of the, the health and safety of our downtown. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. Absolutely. Right. We do not have those issues. Are you going to be implementing this change just across, across the board, or do you have sort of a test and evaluation period, like metrics and really tracking to see if it's working? So, so Lennon and Harvard, Lennon and Harvard, Harvard that yes. test, okay. and uh, the numbers that Sarah just read to you, and, and you saw the, the high volume and then the volume of service calls go down. And again, um, the, the question is that the, there's three pieces to this. Um, and the park curfew hours, if we were a larger community where you had activities beyond the baseball, beyond the basketball that are happening in the park, um, I would say it's going to create a, an impact. It might create a, a disparity there. But right now, we don't have other than you walk your dog, you go and observe bats, and those are not the activities that we're looking at. The activities are when there's occupation, Land and Park there for a while, and Dr. Waters probably saw this and heard from playing their neighbors. I'm not kidding, there was at least a dozen people that had partial tents set up by uh, pulling tarps over their shopping carts. I, I have plenty of pictures if anyone's interested. And I have pictures just from yesterday. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I feel like we need to move on because we're sure. repeating uh, yeah. the same thing. And this is across the board. And like, and we, I, we are just now hearing about like the shelter thing. I can't even think about it in this short of a time. Like, if that's an impact, but I have thought about the curfew. This doesn't apply for my park. So my park has people using it at night, and and. Not everyone needs to do an organized activity. That's what their park space is for. Organized activities are for a small segment of the population who is able to sign up for an organized activity. My park is used at night all the time during the summer. People work construction, people work landscaping. You go to Southmore Park in June, at one o'clock in the morning, there's still a family using the shelter for their fourth hour, just relaxing, using the shelter because their kids, they sent their kids home at midnight, but the adults are still out there. I just feel like more laws, you're talking about, you know, we have a hard time, like this is more laws to enforce, like you said before. It's more laws to enforce. We're, we're making the government bigger and more laws to enforce instead of and saying oh but we're welcoming more people to parks well, that doesn't welcome people to parks that tells them to go away and you think oh we're not targeting people that are looking at bats but you are like i'm like like i just just brought back in 2019 i was with three teenagers um and we were watching the meteor shower at sun at sandstone Ranch. we were trying to watch the meteor shower right before school starts i think it's the Perseus. And we had police come up to us. And those kids would have been so freaked out. Then the police saw me and it was all okay. But these were kids looking at stars in the only place they could possibly get away from all the light within their distance. And so it is targeting. It's targeting teenagers, 
I don't know. It's, it's across the board, and I'm glad I worked for Lincoln. I'm glad that you reached out to people, but you didn't reach out to people in my neighborhood. We don't have a problem in the park. I, I know, but now we're going to have, we are, because we're going to have a curfew, you know? And, and so that's the thing, is we're going to have a curfew in our park, and the kid that just has to, like, is just flipping out because their parents are driving them nuts, can't just lay in the field because then they get ticketed, you know? Or they think they're going to get ticketed, so that's the thing, they think they're going to, so it's a barrier. So this, it's just... It, we're just making more things a crime. We need to increase park use, as she said. Increase it. Just have more people out there. That's why we don't have a problem with hand moto. We do have a problem in the middle of winter. That's when the drug use goes in there. It's the middle of winter there. Or it's right next to my house in the alleyway um, in the summer because the park is too busy. So I, don't, I mean, I don't think we can give it enough time to actually pass a motion or you know anything on this to really appreciate the information um, you know, if anyone else has any other just sort of basic information questions you could do that but I agree we should probably move on yeah. I think I have one quick one um I just have one first oh sorry sorry okay and then we'll go to Dan I totally get this complicated I do want to agree as a parent of many teen and as older teenagers younger kids I do agree having to go for a park for a few hours at night, kids like to stay up late, seems like a much safer thing than having them drink and drive, for example. So I, I, I think there could be a nuance to this of, you could, your two hour rule could be in throughout the night, like let someone go to a park at midnight and they didn't leave by two, they can't sleep there. That would change the homelessness part, but still allow night use. I, I would much rather have my teenager go hang out in a park at midnight then drink and drive or anything. I don't you know, she's not looking up to drink, but I and, think the teenage thing is about Let me ask you a question real yeah. quick. So, I, and then this is not, not a debate no, by I, any means, but we have curfew in Walmart. Every city and municipality has a curfew. Do you know the curfew hour? I do not. So, I have a 12 year old. I know my time is coming to work sure. hanging by his feet. I can tell you that our curfew, the only re the only way your kid's going to get caught at a park is if an officer's driving by or someone complains. Right. We don't actively like the curfew. What is the curfew? It's 11. Okay. Which, I mean, we could just go to a whole other kettle of fish. Yeah. You know, yeah. I just want to ask you know, that. You know, I like it. Why is it, you know? What's the age of the curfew? 18. I know. Really? Yeah. So there's the other category. So that's another conversation yeah. we'd love, I'd love to talk I, about. I just want to, I agree with my comment is in the park hours thing that the city council communication it says uh, one hour before after sunset or lighted 10 p.m. except as otherwise posted twice it says that who decides how does that mean any you know put a park petition to say ah we want to otherwise post I mean is that what that means so it's one of the pieces that um, the director's authority or the deputy city manager, who's the Dale Rademacher, could could do that in the rules and regs. Um, so in the the camping piece, we talked about it um, being across the board. That one also says, or as posted, what we recognize is something that um, the proper right is getting hotter. The sunny days, people are out thick and you know they're probably in the water or around water, not having as much clothing on if they're at Macintosh on paddle boards. Again, we're thinking about people who have that, so we're going to be able to post Macintosh and Dickens if you can have your, your shade tent for more than two hours. So those are things. Well, is that, I, my question is, could that be an hour, an hour's uh, loophole that if there is a park, for example, that isn't an issue, maybe you don't change the hours because you otherwise post it, or I, somebody does. I, I, I would say it's, it's more intentional than a loophole. I think that's ah, something that it does well, is gives, you know, people... Reading it twice, I'm yeah. thinking, wow, that's a loophole. So yeah, I, I, again, that's what's Maybe that's something to think about. Yeah, we do all the time. If it's star watching for, for certain parks, it, it gives us more flexibility. Okay. I also read it, you read, read it, you picked it up, you know that there is some discretion built into this. Um, we don't do it very often. I have personally the mindset that if we're going to make a big change, uh, they probably should go back to the community if we're going to make some changes. Those are those places where we want to allow for some flexibility for um, discretion. Sorry. 
One last maybe comment, because I know I would love to ask questions, but I don't really have some time. Um, uh, so my sense here is that this is a, a complex social problem. Yes. You know, all agree on that. Really yeah. challenging. To me, that means that the problem necessitates a complex solution to go along with it. And so one blanket ordinance that has an effect across all parks at all the same time, with the same set of rules, doesn't make a lot of sense to me, and maybe it should be more of a case-by-case -case basis kind of approach um, uh, to solve this challenging problem. So that's just my comment on this. Yeah, yeah. you go back. Um, so thank you so much. Thank we you. really appreciate your thank time you. and all the time you spent working on this. I would just encourage members, if you have more detailed comments, contact members of council and share those, or you could come. It sounds like it's going to be addressed at the council meeting tomorrow. If you want to share thoughts, then. Um, and also, I would just note this is, I mean, in my opinion, something that we would hope in general would come to the board earlier when it's in development. Part two. One very complex problem to another not very complex set of things. So, uh, yeah. Hey everyone, so we invited Steve and Kathy back to continue our conversation from the last meeting about capital improvement projects. And so do you want a presentation or do you want us just to answer? Well, I think what we had talked about is that there would be sort of an overview of kind of like what's, okay. right? Sure, I can explain what this is. Right, and, and, and kind of what are the themes that we're seeing there? Yeah, so we chatted last week about capital improvement projects. Um, last week we were really talking about kind of what we're working on. Last month. Last month. <laughs> just like last week. Yeah. Um, we were talking about kind of the projects that are on our work plan, what we're working on. We we're talking about carry forward funding. Um, and so, what we didn't get to last month was really what we've submitted. Right now, the city's in the process of submitting for capital improvement projects for the five year capital improvement program. Um, and so, what I put in your packet this time, so maybe you could. Um, kind of digest it and, and ask questions rather than having us go through every project, but we're happy to present, present this however is easiest to digest. Um, what you see here is really a draft of what staff has submitted, and it's still in the process of being reviewed um, and making sure all the budgets work. So these numbers don't really look at them too closely because they're still being trued up. Our financial staff and our budget staff has to make sure they present a balanced budget to the city. So what you're seeing here probably is not <laughs> because um, staff submits based on need um, and then we work on each of the funding sources to make sure we're submitting a balanced budget. So just keep that in mind. This is really draft. Um, it's, but it's, based, you know, this it, it's always wrapped. This, this is this is what we provided to the leadership team. Leadership will definitely have questions about these, questions about priorities, questions about funding sources, competing funding sources. Um, these will change. If you remember, we made sort of a, a, a joke last week, but these get adopted by city council with the budget roughly October, mid October every year. By November, we're already working on the next year's CIP. They seem to good for like two weeks. It's good for the year, the year, the first year, but every year we're looking at the next five years, things change in those four outlying years every year. We reprioritize re re projects. So this is the draft of what we put together this year. 
I just think it was helpful to put the numbers in the years that we're asking for the money so you can kind of get a sense of timeline um, when we're thinking of uh, tackling these projects. Um, so, and Kathy broke this out into fully funded projects proposed, partially funded projects proposed, and projects that we um, have identified but that were not, uh, not funded, not shown as funded at this time. So these, when you say under the heading funded projects, and then the numbers, that's proposed yes. to be fully funded and in what years? Correct. Right. Yeah. Correct. And so sometimes the funding might be key, we're going to do design one year, anticipation the next, or different phases, or sometimes, as we talked about last week, um, <laughs> some of them are sort of um, program type CIPs where like, some of the trail CIPs are we're going to work on rough and ready this year, we're going to work on this, you know. Um, so that's the reason for multiple years of funding. Take, take, for example, Dry Creek Community Park Phase 2, a deep PRO 049. That's the balance of Dry Creek Community Park that hasn't been built yet, not in the synthetic field, which is fully funded. But not the rec center and the outdoor pool, which are sort of. If they're under the partially funded, yeah. So yeah, yeah. That right. So that project is, we're showing 1.7 million for design and about 10 million for construction. And we don't have 10 million, we have 4 million. So we're showing 4 million is funded, 6 million for is unfunded. As we get further out, closer to working on that project, we'll figure out a way to fund that. Project. And you're not asking because that's unfunded, means it's not, you're not asking. We're asking council to, uh, council's being asked to approve the proposed funding right. for 1.7 million for design and 4.40,000. Right. Not, not the six, right? right. And part of that's because we already know there's not enough in the fund. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. But there, there's some other, you know, harder decisions. You'll notice St. Frank Greenway is shown as partially funded. Um, we have a lot of projects that we are working on and construction costs are going up. Um, what our approach has been, if you remember, we phase 12 is Golden Ponds out to Airport Road. Phase 13 is Sandstone Ranch east to St. Brain State Park. Well, phase 13, phase 12, we don't have the land yet. And there's some city strategies about why we haven't pursued that land. Um, but we don't, had been showing funding for that project. Phase 13, we have a $1.5 million grant from CDOT. Um, we have another grant application. And so this is the momentum behind that. So we've opted to show phase 13 as fully funded, not show phase 12 as funded now, but we'll come back in future years and figure out a way to fund that. So that would be one of the examples about how the strategies change based on things that happen that are outside of any of our control. Opportunities and concerns, I should say, with the grant opportunities that Danielle was pursuing. Um, right, yeah, we can go through project by project, or you know, we can talk about this stuff for hours. Yeah, so if you have questions about specific projects, not for hours, <laughs> <laughs> but this is a primary discussion item, so please do. Yeah. I, I, just, I don't have one for a specific item yet, but um, so just so I can write myself. And then funded projects, so. Um, we have, like say, PR 083, the drug again is one of the examples, that has no numbers to it. So it's, there's already money from previous years saying that this thing is funded, and if you're not asking for funds, you're going to talk about these skills. Well, PR 083 is um, requesting funding. Is it the bottom of the first page? Uh, dry Creek Park multi use fields is on there as a misnomer. That's not PR 83, that's PR 49. Okay. We got some things mixed up there. Lake Max is right. on there twice too. So, um, if you ask them often, you get more, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. See if Council's actually reading the CIP. Um, okay, so ignore those two blank Yes, ignore yeah. those blank ones. Yes, uh, as far as trails, which is something that I know you're passionate about, we are showing money uh, to fund the Dry Creek Trail from Sands Club East to South Sunset Street. And then uh, we've got to get to that section of Greenway um, between Skyline High School and Pace Street along the Rough and Ready that's just in disrepair and has been for more than a decade. And so we're going to focus, try to figure out a way to focus some time and money on rebuilding that um, 
that trail to make it safer and also putting a bridge connection over the rough and ready ditch to connect to that affordable housing complex that was built a couple years ago. Yeah. Um, again, outside the CIP, you kind of talked about a little in the last meeting and a couple of other meetings and after hours. Do we risk uh, council saying, why do we even give you any of this money? Your $18 million in arrears already, or projects are funded that we don't have staff for. It would seem to make sense to put $400,000 of people to get that $18 million uh, through. Um, and I know that they're two different entirely, but this, and it's not just you, transportation seems like the same problem that we're, that piles and piles of money for projects and not people to make it happen. Before David speaks to that, um, one of our strategies this year, working with our budget staff, is to release some of the funds of that $18 million, we're not carrying it over, and then re-requesting it to the council. Since we failed to spend those in a timely manner, um, we say uh, Fox Creek, uh, uh, Yes. Fox Meadows Park. Fox Meadows Park was, was funded for construction. We took that money out, so we released it back into the, the fund, but now we're requesting again in 2023 for council to approve for us to um, build construction. One way that helps is that it lets me give an accurate cost estimate, because once the project's funded, if I'm waiting three years to build it, that's three years of inflation I don't get, because that money sits at that amount. And so this helps us true up our budgets and try to reflect more accurately the work plans that we are attempting to accomplish with the staff we have right now. But David has some approaches, I think. Yeah. 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 The other thing I'll point out is these are not all CMS projects by any means. I would say <laughs> no, 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 yeah, yeah. I, I agree. And the, the work plan story. that we were presenting last month was kind of looking at Partial. the park and trail planning development staff's work plan. Mm -hmm. um, so these are recreation projects, these are projects that engineers are working on, that Dan Wolfers team. Um, timber. So timber, yeah. Um, so that's all of these. The other um, in that spreadsheet we had at last month, um, we are planning that. Um, we have that backlog, so we were requesting very little in 2023, 2024, and re our requests are in these later years when our work plan will match up. So we are taking that into account when we request funds. We're trying to make sure that that fits. When we start to have time, um, it's not to say <laughs> we, we don't agree with um, you know staffing requests, but <laughs> because it is hard. No, I appreciate these. It's, it's a positive way of applying things because it's a little bit different. Because I, I definitely do get concerned when they see that backlog of money. Why are we giving you more? But if you take it away, I just heard it on my shoulder. I don't like that approach. You have to go back and really ask for again. There's that, there's that assurance that this is an important project. And I, I heard from staff, we're really defunding a really important project. But it also tells a more true story of what we can really get done with the work of staff that we have. And I think that's an important piece too. That when you see those dollars and you see the project, I think the expectation from the council is the public, well, we got those dollars required to get it done. This, this I think, is a little more honest story. But I think it does make people more concerned that when we get this work done already, is it going to be the forces post this role? So to, to address that, to address that though, like how, how do I know as a member of the public that it's now a priority? Because it was a priority four or five years ago, we didn't know it didn't actually happen, right? So that to, to defund it and refund it just means you're just Reach your brain. So it, it does say, yeah, so we keep it in there as an unfunded project. So we, we do have, that's what we do the five year um, CIP. We are keeping track where those projects are. And there's a big, big history on those on when they were started, when we were first put the budget process. So there is there is a record keeping component to it. Um, but I, I do think when people look at those big projects and we go back to council and say, you know, we have to this money, I think there's, you know, a little bit of uncertainty. But yeah, I think we'll all agree that's the part that's going to be practical. And we're still prioritizing based on our maximum budget, which is the community driven prioritization. We've got them in short term projects, medium term projects, and long term projects. We're still trying to get those things done. Yeah. And I think that the other thing that we're doing is we're trying to make sure that we're not over spending on the public works and trying to get that done. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
kind of tumultuous five to seven years with flood recovery, RSVP, and uh, COVID, you know, sort of slow down. So uh, we are still trying to you know, take us a little bit of time to right size our work plan and hopefully our, our workforce. Um, the other thing we also talked about is that we don't want to be too thin in the five year planning, hire someone and they have nothing to do. So uh, we're trying to, trying to keep a balance of, of meat on that, on that bone that uh, we can be planning and working on as for our projects anyway. And then if we're lucky enough to add any additional staff, then uh, it'll be work for them to be working as well. So. And I think the ones that we, um, that are a bit more difficult to prioritize are maybe when you break out the, the trail repair projects and the park renewal projects and things like that. But the master plan does speak to that. We do have things that pop up, a playground that's damaged, it's decommissioned. It's now a priority, otherwise it's closed. <laughs> you know, so um, those are the other things that we um, have to keep capacity open for, um, and that's what slows the other things down. About the like full cost budget you have for these projects. Part of that includes the capacity to actually implement the project. So I know that probably they come from different funding sources, but are you ever able to share as part of your proposal? And I don't know if this is a question for you, David, but you know, here are our priorities and here's the sort of level of staffing we would need to, you know, actually deliver on this in X time. So that's one question, and then a sort of related question, which is, I, it would be interesting to know, sort of, what is the level of project management and staffing that a city of our size, like other cities of our size, might have in order to, you know, in this area, not like across the whole city, but for these kinds of projects. So those are the two questions. Oh, sorry, I was trying to catch you up. Hey, just trying to Kathy to punch that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different answer from us. So go ahead. Um, <laughs> So the, actually, I'll, I'll go back to the, the kind of staffing for this, this type of group. Um, I actually asked Kathy to start looking at that, um, coming from our, some other local organizations with folks that might have felt like, you know, trying to do this with this local groups. Um, probably not what other groups are, are doing. I, I just do that. So Kathy has reached out. If you want to share some of that, Kathy, will you see? <laughs> um, and, and not at all it's easy to find on the site. So well, I did just reach out to staffs at, right now, Fort Collins, Love and Aurora, I reached out to. And you guys tell me if there's other communities that come to mind. Um, and then Boulder is very similar size in our population. And theirs was easily found on the website. They have 14. And there's a split between, you know, they have open space and mountain parks, and then they also have parks and rec. Um, so that um, long range planning, project management, construction management, they have a team <laughs> people. But you can, you know, it, it's hard to compare apples to apples because yeah. you have to look at, gee, are they also designing golf course improvements? Are they doing facility? You know, every community is a little different. Did you find any other parts of that? Oh, you haven't done it back yet. Yeah. Their organizational charts went right off the list. They're still coming. <laughs> yeah. Well, it'll be really helpful. Thanks for doing that outreach. Thanks. And then your first question, though, was. Was just about how, you know, I mean, these are sort of more the, you know, like the yes. project costs, like so how do you build in the actual. We started having that conversation about my board, Steve and Timber and I, and Captain. Looking at too, looking at if we had project managers that did not have ERC review and they didn't have other other things to do within in the city or uh, how can be subject matter experts on the project? We just had the project. Um, I think if you looked at a neighborhood park being built, we kind of went through. You went through. The, they do the RFP. It goes to the person who it goes out and bid. You wait for that to come back. It really is two years to do. A project. Then you can start taking how many people you have and divide that out. And I, I'm still not quite certain on, you know, they can you do two parts at a time if you're doing that. So we're still kind of looking at that a little bit, but we really have to start trying to map that out. And uh, if you have X number of projects and they take X amount of time, how many decades behind are we? So I 
that's that's what <laughs> the, the exercises that I'm looking yeah, at. Yeah, we thought about taking our current project to the timeline and keeping up on how long, you know, yeah. okay. and, from there. And that two years is somewhat of a misnomer because for every every project there's things you have to work through. For Clover Meadows Park, I need to do a replat. That's when I need to go through DRC and go to council for approval. For Fox Meadows, we need to get an easement through from the HOA to connect the um, Country Club golf course where we have water rights to connect over to the park. So that's going to take some time. We have to schools. Schools as well, yeah. The, uh, each every project has a warranty period, but that takes intermittent time during that. So it, it, it I'm still us. working. I'm still working, and I have meetings this week on RSVP City Reach One. Which is where Dickens is. The finished Dickens warranty is already over, but I'm still working the warranty with the contractor for some stuff out there. And so it, these things drag on. It's outside of our control, but it's important that we get what we're paying for. So we. Oh, and I, I mean, obviously, you're never going to get the perfect no, exactly. response for everything. But if you look at you know representative projects and thinking about do we really have kind of the right size project management staff for the size of our community? What, you know, what we envision for our community in terms of getting these in place. I would say that's one of the things that I, you know, as hard for Stephen Kathy to say, but I think their years of experience is like kind of like the pace. They just, you know, you got to go that, that, that buffer, and there's going to be that if it's the school board, if it's the HOA, they're going to have that with every project. So let's build that into it and see where we get. So um, I think when Kathy and I were keeping two or three years on the end of the park. And, you know, yeah, and I think about the, the, the garden Approval, um, and then we appointed that project in its phases. So it certainly that's a longer than two years. <laughs> yeah. and, and maybe I'll share right now. Jeff asked me if I was going to share this. It's going to be a public record, so I sound like I'm not trying to use this board to push my agenda, but I'd like to be able to respond to this group that when I get requests from Dan Wolfer's open space group or from um, Timber's group and the parks supervisors, I have to go through and then rank those before it goes up to Harold and the council. And my two top priorities this year are looking for a um, manager for this group and then a project manager one. So it's one of the lower end take on ad hoc projects that constantly distract and get, you know, Steve and Kathy pulled into. And someone really to keep their eye on that long term vision. How is what they're doing this year tying in to envision what's the next step to that? How does this crowd connection maybe tie to next parks so to get that long range piece? Where the, the seniors can really work on those places, they're great at building those, those parts out there. So, those are my top priorities. Um, the council have a lot of stuff out there, and um, we'll see what happens. But just so you know, for me, I hear what you're saying, um, I hear what staff is saying, and that will go into my top priorities. Would that manager position be attached to the project also? I would have them doing some projects. I mean, it'd be a working manager, Timber does some projects. But People that that level, that supervisor manager, Dan Wolford does real estate deals for me. Um, so yeah, there would be the ability to pick up some slack to it. But it's what I really see that that slack being is going to be the DRC work and the liaison work and the vision planning piece. That again, are, you know, we don't want to take all the fun out of it too. There's other pieces there as well, but piecing it up, like we also pick up those ad hoc pieces that go high level mentoring for those project manager ones to do. So. Our, our world, usually there are kind of the long range planners, the managers are more our planners doing the master planning and things like that. And then you have landscape architects, project manager levels, and then some support staff on the construction um, implementation. And um, so that seems like the structure that I see in the others. It's kind of doing both the long range planning and the implementation. And yeah, decide. I'm every day. Just so we understand the structure, of who are your managers right now? Who's the referee? Yeah. 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 It's, that, 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 that's something that would be solved. It would, it would be a person that would be with David Skeen, David Dan Timber, Ken, right. with managing these positions and, and, and maybe another one. Yeah, we're both senior project managers, and then we have Dan now, who's a project manager too. Right. Um, and Danielle, again, because General fund is a tough fund to you know it's a hard one to work with. So Danielle, yeah, you know, we did have you know Button Rock is a water project and we need to work there. We have other water bodies of water that need some master planning. And again, 
open space has new acquisitions and trails. So I was able to use open space and water funds for a portion of her. So she only has a third of general funds. So I, you know, in any given year, it may not be a perfect one third, one third of time. Danielle definitely has to commit time to open space and water resources. Other questions? Any questions on specific projects? Yeah. Well, I remember last month we talked about. Oh, you talked. I think it was bridge replacements. Like there was one in. Um, Spangle Park. No, another one. My twenty first and Garden Acres and you know, uh, repurposing bridges. And I don't. Maybe I just missed it, but I don't see right. small items on this list. Yeah. Is that correct? So I mean, there's still a lot more than. These aren't, yeah. this isn't that a complete list. That would be found list. on here under PRO 136, Park Bridge Replacement. We're ah. requesting $40,000 out in 2026, and that's really that. to do an assessment, to, to, to do a, a uh, across the system, um, ins inspect the bridges again. They haven't been inspected since 2012, I think, and to, to re-up that program and then determine the priorities. So the bridges that I mentioned last month are funded. Got it. Oh, so that's why they don't appear here. Ah. Yeah. So yes, we have all the stuff that we haven't done yet. This is the stuff that we're not going to be getting done in the future. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. But, but, but I yes. heard that. Okay, so <laughs> then... That's, that's, that's a good example of how right. I'm not asking for a lot of funding because I already have it. Yeah. Right, right. Well, then, <laughs> then maybe you can tell me the question I really have is that we've addressed in past years, what about a shelter or something at the Quail Tennis Courts? Is that in anything or not on this five-year plan or never going to happen no it's never not never going to happen that's, that's going to happen it's um, that's going next. no it's it's one of those smaller projects it would be a great project for pm1 we haven't found a place to shoehorn it in yet um it did have i'm trying to remember if lta I did. is in my ear because i play tennis and right. they know i'm on this board <laughs> so i get a lot of I can, get, I can get back to you as to whether I release that funding or not. I had $100,000 previously funded that I had savings from the tennis courts that I was going to use for that and to rebuild the trail around the parking lot so it's a better fit between the rec center and oh, the greenway. Right. Um, okay. I, 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 I'll have to look back and see if I let, let, let that funding go, but it's still on there as a project. It's, it but it's it's not. Well, been, that's you told me this yet. in past yeah. years, yeah. but now I don't see it again, and so I just wasn't sure if this is not a complete list. And it sounds like that's I'll true. have to look and get back to you on that. Okay. Okay. Those are the types of projects that are really disappointing for us that we can't. No, I get it. You guys got these big ones that have to. Right. As well as you know, people want them just to stripe some pickleball courts. I mean, and that's a conversation for later in the. <laughs> a lot of those requests that make sense that we seem quick and easy to do, but you know, I'll never get to Fox Meadows if I do five of those projects. That's the one that they call Future Park, right? Yes. I told you that, that yeah. several residents say that's its name. That's the it name. should be its name. Maybe it's Stacy. <laughs> that's the uh, I would have a question on the part of the CID Do we Do we start like Figuring out aging when we're looking at parks. I mean, there are things that break, right? The structures like break, and there's warranty issues with that. But when you're looking at implementing a park, we already looking at well, you know, this has got life of 20 years, or 10 years, or 50 years. It should start it coming to our radar for the CIP again at some point. That's how we manage yeah. the park renewal program. And that's mostly PRO 186 and PRO. sit down together, when is the life cycle coming up, and then most of the time we still have to physically go out and see, you know, it's just says, because the program says 15, 20 years, maybe it still looks good, maybe it deteriorated faster, so um, we certainly do that. Um, I think where we struggle, the, the master plan talks about that, our Parks Recreation Trail master plan talks about kind of this sinking fund kind of um, philosophy, which we, we haven't really gotten there. Yet, but this two dollar fee is getting us over the hump. But the, the 
um, another funding source to have us sort of keep up with it rather than catch up with it. Um, so, Jack, I see you have a little bit of a gap with them because we've been trying to identify some stuff in here. What these gaps are at? Part of it is, you know, the tumor in history will look at and say, yeah, that's starting to need to be replaced, but Kathy's going to renew it in two years, so we just let it go and we buy a new slide that we know the whole thing's replacing here. So we, we still have some of those conversations like, you know, when does it become a refresh, a renew, or just, you know, maintain? maintain. Yeah. So we, we do have a few gaps in that I think that's uh, still that who does what, where, and when, and we're always kind of trying to find But I think the idea in the master plan is as soon as the park opens, we need to start investing right. in the fund that's right. going to keep that park, that. that's yeah. going to replace the bigger things, because our operations and maintenance budgets don't have that capacity to replace a $60,000 playground or whatever. You have several on here that are lame, renewal or yeah. replacement. I mean, yeah. I see that to your point. There's a debate as to whether they should be more maintenance or hit the capital improvement program. Right. There's kind of this fine line. Yeah, we're, the projects that I started when I first started working here, they're coming around for some of that renewal thing. And the philosophy is what does renew mean? Renew means replace in kind? Or does renew mean to refresh to current public public desires, trends, that sort of thing? Roller hockey. We built three roller, four roller hockey courts back in the late 90s, early 2000s, those are not used as, as much anymore. Futsal, a little bit. Um, I haven't seen a hot, I've seen one hockey player in the past three years left hand. But does it? Does it? Yeah. We're not going to take out the public process, but we do think that that's something that could become pickleball, or some of them should become pickleball. Um, but those are the sort of things where a project, it could cost $200,000 to replace something where it could cost a half million to re refurbish, renew that replaced thing. And we haven't settled on how we should plan to fund that. But we don't have enough. <laughs> or we don't have enough. Yeah. Any last questions? Thank you so much. I just want to say how much I appreciate how hard you work. So like none of these conversations about extra staff, it's all about so do you folks just pick up on our conversations how does this list and priority and enumeration you know it changes obviously and are we supposed to every quarter say you know what we need to reach I mean how do you guys do that you know, where do you take direction? Council, obviously, but Council's more particularly. Right, and Council's never gotten in the weeds on that, except, except for the master plan. Council yeah, yeah, gave yeah. us the direction by adopting the master plan that showed the sequence of And projects. you presumably have a lot of flexibility because you're the experts. Like, this part of town needs something, yeah. time to look for a neighborhood park. Are we, as a board, supposed to be pinging you? Well, I would say guiding? part of why we're presenting you with this, all these list of projects, information, priorities, when we have us if we're off on any of it from what you're hearing from us. We should be leader from the community, council leaders from the community, you do. So I think that's kind of why we're passing this all along. So maybe a couple times a year we need to look at a long list. I don't know. I, I mean, if we're if that's part of our job. Or so our, I think we currently look at it once a year. Okay. Yeah, this is okay. So maybe that's we enough. Wanted to have you know, Kathy said it a little earlier that you know we're really still out that that master plan. We have a lot of work to do, but maybe the sequence is off. And that that plan is a, I mean that's a really good document. It really has a good job identifying the gaps. But sometimes opportunities come up and it pulls us off that, and we have to take it. Well, opportunities and other circumstances come up that kind of pull us off track. But that's where I think checking in and saying you know what this is an identified project. It's maybe an area that has been neglected longer than we want to. Go back and reprioritize, but it really is. We, we have a long list. We chat it through the day, and um, we are talking decades with two staff members trying to see through that original master plan. And I think these lists also break down the master, master plan. Might say, she implementing primary greenway connections is a high yeah, yeah. priority, and this breaks it down into well, what are those actual projects? I have a list of 20 trail connections to make and or repair on the city, and so that's 20 different projects. Just identify the one and that. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly.
Like, yeah, yeah. I yeah. Guys, I think it's not bad to keep like, a long time. If we do a six months check in, because that's where it gets kind of tight work, we get jump in the middle of CIP, and it's not a lot of time to kind of make some tweaks, but maybe that six month check in. Yeah, when you're not quite, quite as busy. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, don't, I didn't mean to <laughs> make us do that. It was more of an idea, you know, to see what other folks thought. We're always open ears. Okay. <laughs> then I'll keep complaining. I, I got that permission, I heard. <laughs> <laughs> and that's part of the reason why I try to show up at these meetings is if you guys have questions that come well, it's great, thought Steve. of it, and have been coming here since I've been on the board, it's great. And I'm, I'm happy to answer the questions about these things and what the reasons are why we try to change our priority 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 prioritize the way we do. Jeff or uh, David or uh, Paige, do you want to need this up anymore? Because I have to sit here and keep moving my mouse. No, I don't think so. No? Okay. Great. Oh. Great. Yeah, tomorrow night, uh, your motion that you made in February is going before council. Um, council Member Waters, uh, a few weeks ago, asked for the Council to accept your motion and give any other direction they might have. And I wanted to let you know that that uh, is going to be discussed uh, tomorrow evening. Anything you'd like to add? Scott? Well, I'll be shocked <laughs> if, you, if the uh, statement from this group isn't accepted, right? And then it'll, it's going to get into the queue in terms of scheduling. Now, there's a there's a much bigger discussion about about your recommendation and what's possible that's emerging, not just around recreational amenities, but around a number of categories. And I, I, it'll, I think it'll show up there. And I, and, and I don't, that's not, a, that's not a public discussion right now, but it will be, I think, before tomorrow. And um, it, it'll, it will, we'll come back to it in the context of this other set of ideas that are emerging. Oh, yeah. Uh, I went to the Senior Citizens Advisory Board last week to talk to them about a future recreation center. They were very excited that we had reached out to them. Um, they made some comments about things that they would like to see in a rec center. And they also made a motion uh, supporting Pratt's motion, and Councilmember Martin will bring that up tomorrow evening as well. But, but like Tim said, I, I don't think there's going to be a lot of future conversation until later meetings. Give us some things that it won't get lost. But I, I, I can promise you. And would it be helpful to have any members of PAB just sure. there for the motion? No. Yeah, I mean, Paige, if you came even during public invite to be heard, just to acknowledge it's on the agenda. That you're here to answer questions if people have any, um, or you know, just to be a resource during the conversation. My guess is there will be very little discussion. You'll know, get you know the council will act on it pretty quickly. I, I was in a meeting earlier today with the mayor, and I heard her say, "I think this isn't something we should be thinking." So, okay. And what's the status of the feasibility study? Uh, we are taking the appropriation to. Um, the discussion tonight reminded me, and I saw it in the list, of the Button Rock planning, uh, I think it was June 13th at our meeting, we get an update, and is that going to be too late or in time, or uh, with respect to tonight's discussion, how much, what's the, what happens after June 13th, or what's the future? The reason I 
in particular, I'm worried that there is going to be a lot of dog owners upset when the impression I get from Danielle is that they're going to say no more dogs at Button Rock. And so I don't know if all of the public input has been heard or you're going to get a lot of it late or try to slide it through without anybody noticing, which I don't think so. But I just want to know what the time frame is for the whole Button Rock feasibility, go before council, get passed, and then people say, what? I can't take Fido? I mean, that feels like that could happen. So I just talked to Danielle again today about the process on this again too. And she's still working on trying to pull, you know, we, we've had some challenges with consultants. She's doing a lot of the work that she was really intending on doing, which has slowed down the process. Um, but there always can be, you know, we, we have a core team of subject matter experts, other local agencies, wildlife biologists, um, watershed people. So there always can be a staff recommendation or a task force recommendation, and we would always present that with, but here's what we heard from Pratt, here's what we heard from Waterboard, here's what we heard from the community, and the community has a place to go. So we could also take that and just say, you know what, what we heard from Pratt is something that we could incorporate into our staff recommendation. We still have time for that as well. I okay, think. so. I Sometime, I forget what it was, June, it was like two weeks, and then it goes to council in July sometime? Was that the impression I get, or? It may be today there is still some uncertainty on Friday okay. because of those deadlines. Wow. In light of tonight's, we don't want to scrunch it together, I guess, is my point. I absolutely agree, and that, that, that is a, that process is probably what, you know, Steve and Kathy and the city are much more accustomed to where you're, you're doing work as an internal group, you're working out with, you know, other stakeholders in the community, but then you're reaching out to your boards and stuff and taking that into consideration as you're forming your final presentation. You know, I, I think you know, we always are trying to go with the best thing to get sent through is this is, you know, what staff recommendation was, private supported it, water board supported it, yeah. and, you know, here's where it ends up. That doesn't always happen, um, but that, that's kind of where we always like to try to make sure we're listening and, and read information, even if it is not in alignment with that, they would never go without this. No, I look forward to getting the update. Again, I'm only asking you about the timing, just yeah. being sensitive, sensitized. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah. Um, any concerns, Steve, about uh, you taking away the sled? That was my question, too. <laughs> <laughs> taking away what? Sorry? The sled hill. So, yeah, so uh, to build this levee over here behind, behind uh, uh, between the high vault and bottom of the river, we uh, need to, if you can imagine, after the flood, we came in and put a bunch of river bottom material in there. So, it's a lot of sandy gravel aggregate material to build a true levee slash dam, which is what this is going to be. Made clay material, um, and so that material out of the dry creek is clay. So it looks like the, the core has been working with the state engineer's office to the delay construction probably from October till December, January, and then um, they'll be taking 18,000 yards of soil from the flooding hill over there but replacing it with the material they have over here. It will last probably four or five months duration of moving material in and out, maybe three, four months. In the winter? Yeah. Oh, that's when they're sliding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was my concern. Right? Unfortunately, the $10, million, $10, the $10 million grant from the court takes precedence over uh, temporary sliding hill anyway, and so that money is tied through federal funding, and so we need to spend money to help. So uh, we'll, we'll be doing that. Um, what percentage is the good value? We're having it surveyed right now. Um, probably about uh, half. I think there's probably about 40,000 yards in that pile. And that's so that you're replacing it with what's coming from there? From what the trail is sitting on between the pond and the creek right now. Over at the wall. But why would we take that and put it back at the park when the park mound was there in case we needed it in the future? No, the park mound is not there in case we need to do the park mound was accommodated through the design of the rest of the park. That mound was oh, 
the master plan and the design development documents show that dirt being used in other locations throughout the park site. Which is well, why I take the crap stuff out there. It's not crap. So that's what we're using it out there. It's, it's not great not for a sledding hill. It's not good for a levee. Okay. We don't, no, have, flood, we don't have flood water stuff. We don't have I don't know. It sounds scrapey to me. Yeah. It sounds like it would be scrapey. We'll seed it. And, um, oh, okay. I mean, yeah. Right. Like, you know, it's like, you know, it's close on the surface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, So that that is probably the big update that we did get confirmation from the core from their geopathic holes that that soil will be suitable for what we need to do for here. So will there be like notice? Like yeah, we got to figure that. I think. Yeah. And you might just talk about that there is a future sledding hill that goes. In. Right, yeah, the, 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 the future park has a sledding hill over at the west side of the park over by Mountain Drive. So there's yeah. a permanent sledding hill. There wasn't a lot of merit in hauling that soil all the way over the other side of the park that we weren't improving at that point in time, which is why we popped it where we did. Right. Um, where there was a huge rest. I did see that that was on your post. Dry Creek, yeah. Probably yeah, four, yeah, three, four years now. Seven projects in But actually, no, no, no. What's, what's interesting is that that's why this whole resident conversation is very concerning to Kathy and I. And because if we, depending on where the public slash council decides to put a rec center, that's going to throw our entire work plan in the loop and we'll be changing priorities. If it's Montgomery Farm, Montgomery Farm is not master planning yet. We'll have to go through a whole master planning process for that whole park. Clark Centennial is going to impact park renewals significantly. Dry Creek is going to impact Dry Creek Park and have to maybe move that up, pushing other projects off. And then uh, Quail is never going to happen. <laughs> I, I, think, I, think, I think Harold is going to have said that. So. Well, the feasibility study consider sort of like how long it would take to implement a new rec center at any website? Oh, yeah, it'll include that. I mean, just but like the gonna, difficulty of actually doing it. We want to have that work done as a part of the study so that when, when and if we ever go to the voters that we have a designated location. And then, you know, then we'll have a blog to put on a master plan, here's the rec center and party, and then we'll design everything else around it. You know, the Dry Creek already has that blob shown, so it'll be a little bit easier. But I still want to go through studies and things. We've learned more about that land since we've done a master plan, and so we still have to look at some traffic and geographical expansion of soils and things like that. So but yeah, it's that's that's why our I've been tracking this rec center thing, like it really is because recreation We'll manage the rec center, but the park development is all going to fall on Cassidy. And so that's what will change in the future. So, other questions from the packet? Other items from the staff? I just said one other thing. In the meeting minutes, I was just having my son this morning or this afternoon, um, it said you would talk about the crab tour at the end meeting. So, <laughs> <laughs> We can do that. Okay. I, I do have a couple of things that I would share. Okay. So the the first item, and I don't know, Dan, if this this involves a pickleball. Uh, David and I have been meeting quite often with pickleball folks. Um, it's our goal to uh, reach out to the tennis association and two of us meet with uh, at least their board and get some feedback on the future of needs that tennis has as well as trying to do some joint use where pickleball and tennis can play at the same locations and then we're going to bring the two groups together and uh, have more conversation about what the future of both are. Um, one of the things that pickleball is really pushing right now is lining the courts at, at Dawson. And we're also getting feedback from tennis that that would be a, a mistake because it would impact uh, 
how they can use uh, sanctioned tournaments and matches there. They can't have pure ball lines on the sanctioned order. So we're working on that and we'll continue to do that. Pickleball is, it just seems to continue to grow. We put lines on the courts over at uh, Park Centennial. Steve has got courts included at, uh, you know, Gallo. Uh, and still, there seems to be more demand than what we can keep up with. That we, we may also put pickleball lines uh, underneath the pavilion so that they could play some matches there with some cover from the sun as well. And Roosevelt? Yes. And the challenge there is how you keep the ball in where it's not rolling all over the place. And that they'll have to. That'll be really loud. That roof of our workshop and that loud ball, that'll be really loud. It'll be interesting to hear. <laughs> Your neighbor um, likes to be using the ice cream. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 like going to the boards. Um, I the LTA board has pinged me, and that's great. You should talk to them. That's the way, and get them all together. That'd be great. They told me that they're like you. They're not interested in having Dawson line because they have uh, leagues meet at uh, Pratt and Carr, and they. There, there needs to be five courts for a match, and so then they use one at Dawson, which is the reason. And they would rather, at least I was told, they would rather you took Clark Centennial and make six pickleball courts out of it and give up on tennis or Collier Park, like you, like we all did for Hover. They would rather just do that and not reline because of the whole USTA mumbo jumbo about double lining, and I get it. Parks and Rec would let rather everybody can play. You know, I, I get all that, but I'm telling, and they may tell you this when you talk to uh, the guy I'm talking to you most often is Scott, the chairman of their board, um, and I think he's serious that there is no demand he sees, not from LTA, maybe neighborhood tennis players would care, but they just assume you put a whole bunch of courts at Clark Centennial and take the pressure off of Dawson, for example like what happened at Hover. And Hover is packed all the time. I mean, there are, there are six courts and there's 24 people playing and there's people waiting. So do that again, as opposed to at Dawson, where it's just gonna be two courts and that precludes tennis for a, a big, you know, a big empty space with two little pickleball courts in the middle. So- It's a lot cheaper to paint lines than it is. I, that, but can you guys add that to your list? Yeah, well, no, like, <laughs> I mean, you know, you get 3x the number of courts, yes, is a way to look at it. So, you know, I don't know. Look at Clark Centennial Park for Parker Gold, who's on a five year plan, uh -huh. and is definitely a great candidate for more of a complex because we have the empty slab of concrete that used to be a skate park, we have the in or the hockey rink that's you know down at the two, we've got tennis courts. So, I mean, when yeah. we look at Parker Gold, but again. That yeah, yeah, they're not interested. Yeah, they, you, you go paint Dawson next week, you know, all you guys are done. I get it. And with the youth center there, the school district right there, I mean, I, I just think we look at it even with Carmen and the community and neighborhood resources. Clark would be a great community location for a nice complex. Put it on the list. Well, the LTA folks said they were. Should, their question was, should we be sending out letters to the folks to go to city council and resist Dawson? I mean, that, they're really worried, really, really worried about Dawson getting lined. So talk to them before right, you Right now paint. there's no plan okay. from our point of view to paint lines there. Okay. Pickleball has a different Yeah, <laughs> right. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then the other thing, you know, swimming season is rushing at us, but uh, lifeguards and pool managers are not. So in the next week or two, we are looking at uh, what we're going to be able to safely open. And uh, it's, it's not a, a great thing right now. The council was great enough to increase uh, our minimum wage to 50-50 starting to have a little bit of impact with that uh, with lifeguards but we're really struggling with uh, pool managers right now and 
uh, so we will, once we've made a decision, I will email all of you uh, what that decision is on, on our hours. Um, and I uh, just wanted to give you that heads up that, that it is going to be pretty tough right now. The chicken trouble they talked briefly earlier, you mentioned 15 being the age limit on the website. I looked it up, it says 16, so that might be a mistake. Well, lifeguards can be 15 if they can take training. It right. says that age requirement in the post on the long one, let's say the 16 months. Well, that, that's wrong. That's good, because yeah. I told myself, yeah. sorry, you can't do it. Yeah. So. No, they, they can be 15. Okay. For all the jobs, I mean, not management, but entry level lifeguards and other things are 15. Yes. Okay. You have to, according to the Red Cross, you have to be 15 to be able to take the lifeguard training. Once you have that certification, you will hire. I noticed that uh, teenagers are slow this year with their with some jobs for now. Yes. Just so you know, like I mean, they, they can still come. Yeah. I mean, that would be lifeguards, not managers. They can still come. They can still be applying, and it's just going to be difficult for you to plan. But they seem to be slow. It seems like the college students are kind of slow this year too. It, yes, I would think of those teenagers. <laughs> At least my own yeah. teenager <laughs> college students. So, but it's our hope that we might have to start out smaller, but as we're working through the year, be able to increase our hours yeah. to based on how many staff we can hire. Anything else from staff? Any items from the board? Okay. I just have one question. Uh, related to, of course, this whole overall discussion is the ski park behind the rec center. Yes, 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 it does. Yeah. I had too many glasses. Take the ball back. I mean, basically, they walk from that kind of big ball. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's really, it was, it's yeah. really it's we're all pickleball. <laughs> One of the best opportunities for pickleball is in the uh, inline skating. The challenge is, is that the surface isn't always the best because it can be kind of slippery. And yeah. so, yeah, that's another thing we'll be talking about over the coming months. Has the rec center changed? Like, I remember back in the old days, we used to always say in the catalog something like seniors pickleball. Is it still advertised that way? Because that's yeah, not as welcome. It is, it is. But the, the, there's so much demand, we have to separate them. And when younger people can play, it's when the courts aren't available. So it, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. It, it's just amazing how many people are talking about pickleball right now. And it's, it's not just one. I mean, it's a yes, good market it's, study for a group that's looking at product pickleball stuff. And people, I mean, I had 200 people, 80% of the bottom line answered, but it's a survey that we had. Like, boom, oh yeah, this is what I'm going to play. And then the older survey was the same way. Like, people were on top of it. Erie, Louisville, Lafayette, they're all like, oh yeah, we need more stuff. Everybody. Like, well, like, you don't understand the CIP process, so this is good. <laughs> and this is how it's going to go. And they're like, no, no. Yeah. Like, you go to Dick's, and the whole tennis section is gone. It's yeah. all pickleball now. It's amazing. I yeah. mean, it's just it's incredible. In six months, <laughs> it's just incredible. No, I'll never play pickleball. It's so fun. <laughs> because it, it takes skill. Whereas <laughs> on the tennis court, I run around a lot, and I do fine. I would give up the important part of my game, which is just to run. <laughs> I think it's all it would all be a moot point if we introduced Dada balls in the mouth. Oh, yeah, that would and, and, and just, make sure it's a different sized court, right? Right. Yes. <laughs> it's a hexagon. It's a hexagon. <laughs> and it's much you cheaper. Paint more lines. No, no. <laughs> Any much other items from the board? <laughs> all right. If not, I can take a motion to adjourn. Yeah. I make a motion to adjourn at uh, 8.40 p.m. Yes. Second. I second yes. that. All right. All those in favor? I'm a little bit. Any opposed? Okay. All right. Meeting is adjourned. Yeah. All right. So, um, <laughs> right in the house. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, just.